This video is brought to you by friend of the channel Squarespace. Stick around to learn more about them as well as a special offer they're making available through my channel. Gamers, what a week of news we have before us. Kingdom Hearts 4, a Max Payne remaster, a new Subnautica game, a release date for Hollow Knight Silk. I'm just joking, there's no release date for that. <laughs> okay, I know I took things too far, I apologize. Please don't dislike the video, it won't happen again. If you're still here, I appreciate that. I appreciate you giving me a second chance. I'll make it up to you with some news, some announcements, a review roundup, and a feel-good story you're not going to want to miss. Trust me on that. The video games industry is slowing down a little at the moment, but this week in video games remains as packed as ever, so let's get straight to it. Here comes the news. Let's bite off some industry news first. Right now, the entire video games industry and a bunch of other industries are all jostling to get first mover advantage in the upcoming Metaverse Wars. Facebook are so balls deep on this that they renamed themselves Meta, despite their vision of the Metaverse being hilariously parochial, outdated, and cringe. Not unlike the Zuck himself, actually. This week we've got some more insight into how Meta will build its metaverse. The answer? By ripping off creators. The house that Disinformation built announced that if you sell any digital good you've created in Facebook's metaverse, Facebook will take 48% of the sale price. That is rubbery, and also deeply hypocritical because it was only November of last year that Zuckerberg publicly criticized Apple for their 30% cut on the App Store. Meta laughably described this 48% as a pretty competitive rate, reflecting how little respect Facebook has for the intelligence of anyone still engaging their platforms. I do think that various metaverses will blossom and bloom over the coming decade, but I still remain 1000% certain that Facebook's pivot to this will go down as one of the biggest blunders in corporate history, and I can't wait to see it. You want to know who likely will find some metaverse success? Epic Games. In the years to come, I expect we'll talk about Fortnite as the progenitor for metaverses, as its combination of music, film, video games, and other pop cultural artifacts, combined with its cross-sectional appeal to different ages and demographics, are the building blocks on which a metaverse might be built. Epic have made no secret of their intent to go in this direction, and this week they got a sterling endorsement for that plan from Sony, who invested $1 billion in Epic. That's not the first time they've done that, by the way, since they had earlier dumped a bucket of money in Tim Sweeney's lap. This investment is specifically for metaverse-related activities, so you know that Sony are going all in on this as well. It's not just them, though. Lego also invested $1 billion with Epic at the same time Sony did, again, citing the metaverse as a goal. Think about that. Epic Games, Sony Entertainment, and Lego are all teaming up to build a metaverse, one block at a time, no pun intended. I can't see that not working on some level. I'd be interested in that, to be honest. Facebook? Get fucked. But the creativity of Epic, Sony, and Lego? There's something there, and I'm certainly going to be keeping a keen eye on that one. Sticking with industry news, it's no secret that acquisitions are all the rage right now, and while attention often remains fixed on the likes of Sony and Microsoft and Epic, Embracer Group are pretty much the biggest buyer on the market, at least in a volume sense. These guys have spent over $8 billion on acquisitions since 2020, which pales in comparison to bigger players, but guess how many studios they've purchased in that time? 62. Yes, you heard me. Included in that was Gearbox, makers of Borderlands, and Dark Horse Comics, makers of, well, comics. You'd think that 62 Studios might have been enough, but nope, they're still going. This week, the CEO told the Financial Times that he had plans to make a similar number of acquisitions over the coming months and years. Similar to 62, my god. Are there even that many studios to buy up? The question is, of course, rhetorical, but the point remains. Embracer have big dreams, and they aren't slowing down anytime soon. Final piece of industry news, Activision Blizzard's quality assurance testers got a well-deserved win, but there is a catch. The background to this story is that QA is generally treated like shit across this industry. Not paid well enough, not guaranteed the job security other staff have, the first to be laid off, often forced to crunch, and not given enough respect for their important contribution to the process of making games. Case in point, QA staff at Activision-owned Raven Studio were summarily sacked without cause, despite earning a criminally low low wage and the workload continuing to pile up. Staff fought this, going on strike for months before eventually voting to unionize, which if it eventually happens, will mark the first video game workers union in all of North America. Fast forward to this week and Activision Blizzard have announced that every single one of its 1,100 QA testers will be converted from contractors to full time and guaranteed a minimum of $20 an hour, which for most of them is a pay bump. That's good news, but I'll note that it doesn't take much courage for Activision's leadership to do this now since they're about to hand over the keys and the ongoing cost to Microsoft, but that's a rather cynical reading I suppose. 
The catch is that staff at Raven Studios are not eligible for these changes because Activision Blizzard are legally not allowed to provide them, given that these workers are in the process of unionizing, so changes need to be made through collective bargaining mechanisms. This is often interpreted as a union-busting tactic, as concessions made to non-union staff might force unionizing workers to think twice, but I suppose we'll see just how nefarious all of this is when negotiations with Raven staff have concluded. Here comes a zinger. Battlefield 2042. More like Battlefield Under 1000. Like and subscribe. Yes, you've probably seen the headlines since they're just too irresistible for any outlet to not run. But Battlefield 2042 has for the first time ever dropped under 1000 concurrent players on Steam. Obviously, there are going to be plenty of other players on platforms like Origin, Xbox and PlayStation, but Steam numbers are often broadly reflective of overall engagement. And in the case of Battlefield, they're going to be particularly salient since Battlefield's community skews heavily towards PC. This is just another milestone in the road to Battlefield 2042's inevitable early decommissioning. EA DICE abandoned Battlefield 5 early, ditching promised content updates, and that game never had half the problems that 2042 did. It's already been reported that the next Battlefield game is looking to walk back many of the decisions made by 2042, so I can't see a world in which EA want to dump more good money after bad. I expect EA DICE will deliver the required character and seasonal content, which came bundled with the game in various deluxe editions at launch, and then just move on to the next thing, hoping that we'll all forget about how this went down and pre-order the next Battlefield game. Hopefully, we will have longer memories this time around. One developer that is sticking with their game is CD Projekt Red, who this week confirmed that the work continues on Cyberpunk. They recently pushed out the patch 1.5 update for the game, which, along with next-gen compatible versions for PS5 and Xbox Series consoles, offered up a slew of bug fixes and improvements to core gameplay elements like combat and RPG. Feedback to that update has been, overall, pretty positive. And this week, CD Projekt Red's Quest director, Powell Sasko, confirmed that there is, quote, still work to be done, end quote. Quote, and that he was in the process of reviewing new quests for the game daily. These quests will presumably make their way into the upcoming Cyberpunk expansion, but interestingly, Powell did mention that they're working on expansions plural, which, to be fair, was always supposed to be the plan, but I wondered if CD Projekt Red had scrapped plans for the second expansion, given how much work has gone into getting the game back to baseline. Personally, I'm not betting on a Cyberpunk expansion shipping this year, but come 2023, I reckon we can expect an invitation back to Night City. One game that probably shouldn't keep getting updates is eFootball, the latest deuce from casino game maker Konami. Last year, eFootball had the dubious honor of being the lowest rated game across all of Steam. Like, shitty asset flip garbage had better reviews than Konami's reinvention of its once loved soccer franchise. Konami promised significant updates to the game following the disastrous launch and paused scale of their scammy premium player packs, which basically means the game was making no money since it was a free to play title. Konami are about to ship the 1.0 update, which was significantly delayed owing to just how badly the launch went. When asked by Eurogamer why they shipped the title in the first place instead of delaying it, a spokesperson responded, quote, We ultimately had a strong desire to deliver the new eFootball 2022 game to users as soon as possible, in parallel with the start of the European football season, end quote. Put another way, I like money. Well, I promised you something on a new Subnautica game, and I wasn't lying. The project is still not officially unveiled, but this week, developer Unknown Worlds put up a job listing for a senior narrative designer to, quote, join the team working on the next game in the Subnautica universe, end quote. Obviously, this might not be a mainline Subnautica game. Hell, it could be a shitty mobile game spin-off for all we know, but that's unlikely given that the series is Unknown Worlds' most successful by far, and with Below Zero now firmly in their rearview mirror, they're surely looking at what's next. This posting is a little bit of a surprise though, as Unknown Worlds had earlier confirmed that they were working on a tactics-based game currently known as Project M, so everyone kind of thought that that was all they'd be doing. I guess the team are expanding, running two projects in parallel. Given that this next Subnautica game isn't even announced yet, I don't expect we'll be getting our hands on this one anytime before 2024 at the earliest. One unannounced title we can expect to get our hands on relatively soon is the next Need for Speed game. That's according to Venture Beats' Jeff Grubb, who when speaking during a recent Giant Bob podcast said, quote, Need for Speed is still coming this year. That's true. That game should be coming in November. If you're a Need for Speed fan who has bought a next-gen console, here's some news. They're shifting to next-gen only, end quote. 
If true, and it probably is because Jeff has a pretty strong track record, that's a big surprise since there's a lot of sales foregone when shifting to next gen only, and I wouldn't think EA would be up for that. If the November release date is accurate, I'm sure we can expect to be hearing more about this one very soon. All right, it's time for no fucking thanks. I know you all worried that we'd won this war a little too quickly and that no fucking thanks would be retired faster than a Ubisoft NFT, but it seems as though at least one company is keeping the segment alive. Sega. A while back, Sega announced that they were working on something called the Super Game, which is a strange name for a Sega product. I would have thought they would have gone with something like Mega, but I guess not. Turns out the Super Game isn't a game per se, but more a collection of games that somehow connect to each other, possibly through NFTs. One Sega producer said, quote, It's a natural extension for the future of gaming that it will expand to involve new areas such as cloud gaming and NFTs. We're also developing Super Game from the perspective of how far different games can be connected to each other, end quote. To be fair, this interview was done a month ago, but it's only recently been translated by Video Game Chronicle, and the NFT landscape has changed a lot in those four weeks, and by that I mean it's kind of died. Love to see it. Still, the whole Super Game framework sounds really weird, pulling in different technology, studios, genres, all unified by the promise that the games will be AAA blockbusters. I don't know, man, this whole thing sounds a little pie in the sky right now for me. By the way, if you thought the collapse of Ghost Recon Breakpoint would somehow cow Ubisoft into submission, then you'd be mistaken, maybe. When discussing the fact that Breakpoint would get no more updates, Ubisoft said of their Quartz NFT platform, quote, Stay tuned for more updates with features to the platform and future drops coming with other games, end quote. What other games could they be talking about? Well, Kotaku are citing two sources that have confirmed for them that a new Ghost Recon is deep in development. First leaked in that infamous NVIDIA leak last year, the project is codenamed OVER and it's being developed by Ubisoft Paris and it may ship as early as fiscal 2023, putting it sometime between April 2023 and March 2024. This is separate from Ghost Recon Frontline, the recently announced Battle Royale game that got such a bad reception that Ubisoft are apparently rebooting that one. Unbelievable. If Kotaku's report is accurate, you have to wonder how much this new entry will pivot back towards a more traditional Ghost Recon formula, given that the whole looter-shooter thing that Breakpoint tried didn't exactly go down so well with anyone. Final piece of news to round out the news block. The London Games Festival happened this week and one of the awards it handed out was for Virtual Photographer of the Year. Some of the submissions were pretty impressive but top honours went to Joe Mezzi for this truly spectacular shot of a silhouetted and behorsed Arthur Morgan staring at a distant bluff in Red Dead Redemption 2. Nothing else to say on it, it's just a really nice photo and I wanted to share it with you. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, let's do the big juicy one first. Kingdom Hearts 4, baby, it's coming and we got a first look at it a hell of a lot sooner than anyone anticipated. Square Enix held a Kingdom Hearts 20th anniversary webinar the other day, celebrating the long, storied, confusing history of this franchise, while also taking the time to announce a Kingdom Hearts mobile game which will hit closed beta at the end of the year. Given that Kingdom Hearts 3 wasn't all that long ago, nobody expected what came next. The trailer started off looking like some sort of metaverse commercial until we saw Sora just sitting in his crib and then things got completely buck wild out there in the mean streets of wherever this is set. Gotta say, this looks super cool and the thing is this demo was built in Unreal Engine 4 where the final game will be developed in Unreal Engine 5 so it's gonna look even better than this, possibly significantly so given that UE5 is a seriously game changing tool. There are plenty of gags out there that this will be released in like 2030 or something, sure, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe it's sooner than we think. We have no idea because no information on release timings or platforms was provided. So for now, Sora stands can just watch this trailer on repeat and hope it isn't the start of some Final Fantasy 15 level development arc. Go back and research that one if you haven't. While we're on the topic of JRPGs, Euidan Chronicles Rising got a release date, May 10th arriving on all platforms. Now to be clear, this is not Euidan Chronicles 100 Heroes, that crowdfunded spiritual successor to Suikoden, which will be released next year. This is a companion to that. It's a 2D JRPG with some town building elements, and its primary goal is to set up the world, story, and characters for the main game next year. This one had a bit of a mixed reception when previews rolled out, but the good news is that it is gonna be a day one Game Pass release, so you can check it out for yourself very easily. Speaking of Game Pass, oh boy, this next one is huge. Since the launch of the PlayStation 5, there has been one Sony exclusive that everyone has been talking about. A game so good that it alone justifies the PS5's hefty price tag. It was the cornerstone of the PS5 launch and is to this day the number one reason that the PS5 scalping business is still so lucrative. I'm talking, of course, about bug snacks. 
So you can imagine the industry's collective shock when it was revealed this week that not only was Bug Snacks coming to Nintendo Switch, PC, and Xbox, but that it was also coming to Game Pass. I'm not sure how Jim Ryan let this happen, but I expect we'll receive word of his termination sometime this week. You just can't let a game of this caliber make its way to other platforms. Jim dropped the ball here, but you'll be able to pick it up on Switch, PC, and Xbox on the 29th of April. June Spice Wars is an upcoming RTS that hopes to pick up where Westwood left off all those years ago. This one was announced late last year, and it's coming a lot sooner than I expected since it was announced this week that the game will be hitting early access on the 26th of April. Been a long time since I played an RTS, so I'm actually quite looking forward to this one. Halo Infinite has had a rough post-launch period, and that is being very kind. 343 managed to absolutely nail the core gameplay of Halo, but it soon became clear that they were totally unprepared for what it would mean to manage a live service, which is kind of weird since they had plenty of practice with the likes of the Master Chief Collection and Halo 5, sort of. Anyway, after some chunky delays, 343 have announced that a new season is arriving on May 3rd. It's going to have a battle pass and a shop refresh, as expected, but it's also going to have new maps and game modes. No specific word on what those are yet, but anything's better than nothing since Halo Infinite has lost an overwhelming majority of its player base since launch owing to a dearth of content and updates. I will be checking this one out, I'll let you know how it goes. Rogue Legacy 2 has been in early access on PC for quite some time now, nearly two years actually, and this week the developers announced that the game will get a 1.0 release on April 28th. Interestingly, this is going to be a PC and Xbox exclusive, which begs the question, will this end up on Game Pass? No word on that one yet, but I wouldn't be pre-ordering this one if I were you, as Xbox loves to do the whole last minute Game Pass announcement just days before release thing. We've got a small update on Lords of the Fallen 2. This has a new developer since Deck 13 moved on to other things after the first game. It's still in development with the publisher CI Games saying that we can expect the marketing pitch to commence in quarter three of this year and the game will ship sometime in 2023. Final announcement of the week is the money shot. I'm sorry Kingdom Hearts fans. I'm sorry Bug Snacks aficionados. But this next one really does take the cake. We're getting a Max Payne 1 and 2 remaster. It's so weird because I was thinking about exactly this last week when I was going through that list of sexiest video game characters from top 10 casinos. And Max Payne was on there and I was like, damn, that'd be a really great remake, wouldn't it? Sure enough, literally hours later, Remedy announced that they have come to an agreement with IP holder Rockstar Games and that Remedy will lead the development. The two games will be combined into a single package on PC and next-gen consoles. It'll be built in the Northlight engine, the same one that powered Remedy's Control. That is an awesome graphics engine with some of the best environmental destruction in the business. So I can't wait to see Max slowly sailing through levels as everything around him crumples into tissue paper under bullet fire. This really is a fantastic announcement that brings me a lot of joy. Max Payne was one of the defining PC games. I still remember seeing it for the first time and just being blown away by it. It's quaint now, but back then, this was the absolute pinnacle of what video games were capable of, and I can think of few games more deserving of the remastered treatment. So what got released this week? Well, there was that MLB The Show 2022, which as we covered extensively last week, is a baseball game. And it appears to be fine. 77 on Open Critic. Apparently, it's got a few bugs. Not much more to say. Chinatown Detective Agency was that pixel art film noir indie that Xbox showcased a few weeks back. This one has a little bit of Carmen San Diego coursing through it. As often, your in game investigation will require some IRL Googling to make sense of the clues being thrown at you. This one's coming in a little mid, sitting at a fair 71 on Open Critic, and currently sitting at around 60% mixed on Steam. GameSpot reviewed it and scored it a respectable 7, saying, quote, Though the occasional bug or out of place mechanic bogs down the experience, Chinatown Detective Agency delivers a fulfilling investigator fantasy with real world sleuthing." End quote. Don't forget that this is on Game Pass so you can check it out for yourself if you'd like. The only other release was LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga. We touched on the reviews for that one last week since the embargo was up by then. Critics loved it and surprise, the punters really, really loved it. This thing is currently sitting at 94% very positive on Steam with 11,000 reviews in. That is insane for a AAA game to hit that rating. And to be honest, it's kind of weird that Steam doesn't list that as overwhelmingly positive since it's certainly crossed the threshold. From a sales perspective, the game has smashed every prior LEGO game record. It had over 82,000 current players on Steam alone at one point, when the previous record for a LEGO game was like 5,000. This thing is so huge that it was the second biggest launch of the year in the UK behind Pokemon Arceus. Even bigger than Elden Ring in the UK. And I don't know how well that ratio holds worldwide, but that's still an absolutely incredible result. 
I reviewed the game and surprise, surprise, I loved it as well. The review was really late because I just kept getting distracted doing all the side content and collecting characters and ships and man, it's just so fun. It's just awesome, fantastic, wholesome fun. And if you like Star Wars or if you just want a fun platformer for yourself or your kid, or you want to do something with couch co-op, then there are a few better things you can drop your cash on than this. I'll leave a link to my review below in case you want to hear some more. So what's coming out this week? Well, not a whole lot to be honest, and you better get used to that because that pretty much sums up the next six months. It's not all bad though. For example, 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim arrives on the Nintendo Switch today. This is essentially a visual novel, but I know that visual novel purists get really mad if you call this a visual novel for some reason, but it's essentially a visual novel with some light strategy gameplay thrown in every now and then. I played through the first act of this before I had to put it down, I just got busy with other stuff. It remains near the tippity top of my pile of shame, as everyone who's played it has said it serves up a truly mesmerizing and memorable narrative spanning both time and a huge cast of characters. This is very much about just sitting there and soaking up a carefully constructed tale Perfect for you, the couch, and your Batman Snuggie blanket. And if you don't have a Batman Snuggie blanket, then I strongly recommend a Batman Snuggie blanket. Back for Blood is getting some DLC today. It's called the Tunnels of Terror, and it adds some new enemies to fight, three new cleaners to clean up with, as well as a new game mode called the Ridden Hives, which sends you deep underground to fight your way through waves of enemies in this more linear and claustrophobic setting. It's paid DLC, so you can either buy it outright, or you can get it as part of the season pass. Nobody Saves the World was one of the best games I've played this year, and I said as much when I reviewed it back in January. To be fair, not many games had released by that point in January, but months later that statement still holds up, as Juicebox's fusion of Zelda, roguelikes and ARPG just hits so right. This one was exclusive to the Xbox and the PC, but that exclusive window ends on the 14th when the game will become available on both PlayStation and the Switch. It is the perfect Switch game, by the way. In addition to all of this, the game now supports local co-op, where before it was online only. So if you've already played through this one and you're looking for an excuse to go back, now you've got one. Road 96 was one of the more interesting and successful indies to be released last year. It's essentially a procedural road trip game where you set off hitchhiking and your journey will unfold in unique ways based on both the decisions you you make and which events or characters the procedural model throws at you. You're encouraged to take different journeys with the promise of each one being different and memorable. Fantastic reviews all around, 91% very positive on Steam. It was PC exclusive to this point but come the 14th you'll be able to pick it up on both the PlayStation and Xbox. For now there's no word on this one coming to Game Pass but this feels like something that would end up on there one day so watch this space I guess. Last release of the week was Abris or Abris, that clever little destruction game I showed off a few weeks back and might put this on your radar segment. If you like blowing shit the fuck up, then you are probably going to like this video game. It's cheap, it's fun, there's a demo if you want to try it before you buy it. Knock yourself and some buildings out. Put this on your radar. Much like BPM-fused Doom and Crypt of the Necrodancer, so too does Warstride Challenges fuse Doom with Titanfall, with Ghost Runner, with a story about my uncle and Trackmania. Yes, I said what I said. Warstride Challenges is not a first-person shooter in the traditional sense, because while you do have a gun and you are required to shoot in first person, the aim of the game is to complete time trial gauntlets as quickly and as precisely as possible. Part of that involves shooting shit, but much of it involves wall running, platforming, grappling, and a variety of other parkour-related shenanigans. While you're doing all of this, you can choose to race ghosts of other players who have completed the same courses earlier. And to top all of this off, the game features a level creation tool, allowing you to create and share custom levels. That's where the whole track mania thing comes in. See, I told you I wasn't crazy. This is pretty much just that training level from Titanfall 2, except an entire game, and I'm 1000% okay with that. This thing is hitting early access on the 20th of April, exclusive to PC at first, but you've got to assume that a console release will happen at some point if this thing gets enough momentum. If you want to help with said momentum, you can wish this is one on Steam. I'll leave a link to the Steam page below. Sort of free stuff time, and it's sort of the second week of the month, which means that every one of the April giveaways are now live. Highlights include Monkey Island 2 from Twitch Prime, SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated from PlayStation, Life is Strange True Colors from Xbox Game Pass, and Hue from Games with Gold which I hadn't actually heard of before, but plenty of people in the comment section sounded out on that one last week, so I guess it must be pretty rad. Nothing new to add to all of this except for the impressive showing from Epic.
epic. Right now you can still grab Rogue Legacy just in time for the sequel later this month, as well as The Vanishing of Ethan Carter. That is until the 15th, at which point you can grab Insurmountable, a clever mountaineering roguelike that combines Slay the Spire style decision making with procedural map generation. This game is about to get a big 2.0 update this week actually, so this is a really well-timed giveaway. The other one is XCOM 2, which is really fucking cool. I mean, you've probably played XCOM 2 by this point, but if by chance you haven't, then you are about to experience one of the definitive tactics games of the modern era. I played this one back at launch, it totally ruled. I'm looking forward to Midnight Suns, which is the next big thing from this studio, but for now XCOM 2 will do just fine, especially at this price tag. Our Feel Good Story for the week combines two things that always produce an interesting chemical reaction when you put them together, award ceremonies and Joseph Farris. You might remember Farris from his debut moment at the Game Awards some years back. This dude went from being someone none of us knew to being a household name with one quick raise of a finger. Since then, Joseph Farris has gone on to direct the Game of the Year winning It Takes Two, but the BAFTA awards run a little later than Keeley's Trailerama, and so this week when It Takes Two won Best Original Property, he gave a very, very Joseph Farris acceptance speech. It's, it, I mean, this is a surprise. I mean, we're super happy and proud, the original IP. What can you say? I mean, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank, actually, in this case, EA, who had the courage to risk this, because with a new RP, it comes a lot of challenges. It's very good of you, actually. So really happy of that. Yeah, I know, a lot of people... Yeah. Applaud to EA, how about that? <laughs> no, I mean, all publishers are nice. It's like, that's, that's how it is, right, Oscar? Sure. Man, that is a response from a man who does not want to touch that subject with a 40-foot barge pole. This wasn't Farris's only big win for the night, though. It Takes Two also won Best Multiplayer Game, and in accepting the award, Farris displayed the trademark humility for which he is best known. Here we go again. This one was expected, actually. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we were here uh, last time and won also Best Multiplayer Award. It's, uh, uh, both bro brothers also won, so I'm really happy for it. But I don't get the big head, don't worry about it. It's, uh, I don't take it that seriously. No offense to the BAFTA jury, I'm really happy for this. So. Uh, we need to give Joseph Farris an award at every ceremony so we can just listen to the acceptance speech. Game of the year, album of the year, Nobel Prize, employee of the month, doesn't matter. Just give him a little statue and a microphone, stand back and watch the magic happen. Speaking of magic, it's time for me to do my disappearing act for the week, but I have one last trick up my sleeve. If you hit the like button on this video, a burrito will suddenly appear somewhere in your house. I'm not going to tell you where, but it'll be somewhere. So you better find it fast because the cheese does not keep for long. If you are satisfied with either the burrito or this video or both, consider hitting the subscribe button so you can come back. And if you're a glutton for punishment, then perhaps consider hitting the notification bell so you'll know the minute the next video is live. That video, by the way, probably the next edition of this show. But after that, I'm reviewing Ghostwire Tokyo, so I'm looking forward to getting to the bottom of that one. Love you and leave you. Shill up out. Have you ever thought about making a website? If you answered no, then that's a lie, because when I asked, have you ever thought about making a website, you would have been thinking about making a website. See? Gotcha. Okay, so Squarespace helps you build websites, really good ones, really easily. Squarespace have templates ready to go for whatever you need, from blogs to personal portfolios to online stores to weddings and more. And once you've chosen a starting point, you can begin customizing it in minutes. Want to change the color? Boom, done. How about the layout? Boom, easy mode. And like magic, when you've designed your perfect looking website for desktop, it automatically converts into a perfect looking website for mobile. No additional work required, it's just there, ready to go. Squarespace really is that easy. And if you're looking to get a website for any reason, be it personal or professional, then there's no better place to do that than Squarespace. As I mentioned earlier, Squarespace have re-signed the channel for another 12 months. I really appreciate that support. That's amazing. Squarespace are helping me turn my passion into a career. And that's what they do for a lot of people, because if you want to turn your passion into a career, then a website is a really good place to start. To get started, visit squarespace.com, and if you want to get serious, visit squarespace.com forward slash skill up to get 10% off your purchase of a website or a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and thank you for watching it.